Good morning. Um, so this is based largely on pilot work from a PhD research, uh, which is an ethnographic study of Shirebrook, uh, which is a deindustrialised uh, colliery village in Derbyshire. Uh, the pilot work consisted mainly of uh, secondary data analysis of uh, websites, uh, newspapers, uh, newspaper articles, including the public comments, uh, social media, anything to sort of associate with Shirebrook, really. Uh, this gave me an idea of, of some of the ways in which Shirebrook was viewed from the outside. Um, it also consisted of some participant observation, uh, particularly a, a public meeting um, between local residents, councillors and the police uh, that had been organised by a community group. So I want to start with uh, some, some context and provide a short overview and history of Shirebrook, uh, followed by an illustration of some of the ways that the village is stigmatised. Uh, and then I want to look at some theories associated with the consequences of, the, of stigma. Uh, and then evaluate the evidence to support them in Shirebrook. Okay, so uh, <coughs> Shirebrook in the past could have been understood as a model mining community according to Bulmer's uh, sociological outline. Uh, it was relatively isolated. It relied on the colliery to provide the majority of male employment. Uh, and and the, the village actually grew around the colliery. So before the colliery was sunk... Uh, the village was agricultural uh, and just consisted of a few small farms. Uh, the colliery was sunk in 1896 uh, and the population, population increased tenfold. So it was approximately 500 people in uh, 1891 at the census. S uh, and then it was 6,500 in 1901, 10 years later. Uh, the colliery provided uh, lo the local amen amenities to house and uh, attract mine workers to the area. So stuff like homes. Uh, gardens, uh, there was a hotel, shops, places of worship, school. Um, throughout the 20th century, the colliery continued to grow around it. I'm going to kind of fast forward through all that, really. Um, come to the end of the century, and we were seeing big industrial changes, particularly in the coal fields after 84, 85 miners' strike. Uh, you start seeing a lot of colliery closes. Shirebrook survived that first round of closes and eventually closed in 1993 when the, uh, when the industry was privatised. Uh, at the time, it still dominated the, the, the uh, local labour market for men. Um, to give you an idea of the impact closure had, uh, a couple of lo local historians, uh, Roberts and Sadler, writing in 1991, uh, just before closure, argued that uh, closure would affect the whole of the town's economy, not just the mine workers and the families. And that was because for the last 100 years, the, the dominating influence on, on Shirebrook was the colliery itself. So now, 12 years after the closure of the colliery, and as part of the regeneration project, Sports Direct was built and uh, finally replaced the colliery as the biggest employer. Um, Sports Direct are renowned for poor working conditions uh, and are arguably emblematic of contemporary precarious work. There are approximately 5,000 people who are employed there, um, of, of which over 80% are estimated to be on zero hours contracts. Uh, and many of which are Eastern European uh, agency workers, but um, especially Polish. I think there's about 3,000 of them there. Um, this has received quite a lot of news coverage in, uh, recently with the Guardian's expose uh, at the end of last year. So in case you didn't sort of see that, uh, the Guardian revealed that workers were, they were getting searched daily, uh, unpaid. Um, they were uh, under pressure to hit unmanageable targets where they were actually having to run through the warehouse to, to try and meet them. Uh, they could be sacked, sacked for accumula accumulating six minor offences, uh, such as being ill, making minor errors, or excessive toilet breaks. Um, there's also tension in the village, which has been blamed by the media on a clash of cultures between uh, the established residents and Polish migrants that have recent, recently moved there to work at Sports Direct. So I'm going to discuss some of the ways the village is stigmatised, and I want to look specifically at the entry for Shirebrook on a web page called I Live Here. Uh, which used to be called Chav Towns. Um, the slide shows a screenshot from the web page and includes the first couple of paragraphs of Shirebrook's entry. So the, it's not an accurate representation of, of, of Shirebrook, so you wouldn't take it at face value, but it's not, it's not unique in, in, the way, in its depiction either. You see the same sort of things in uh, social media um, and the comments and newspaper articles in the year it first stand as well in the towns and villages that's in the local area. Uh, the village's nickname is Shipbrook, um, which conveys one of the ways it's territorially stigmatised. Uh, Ray uses the term stigmatite to describe our terms like chav and white trash, uh, construct, construct symbolic boundaries around in-groups and out-groups. 
So you can understand Shipbrook in, in, in a similar sort of way, but as a, like a territorial stigmatype. Um, so the term draws a symbolic boundary around the village and at the same time stigmatizes and stereotypes uh, the people within it. So the use of the word, the word ship represents quite a, an established association between the poor and excrement, um, and this renders the inhabitants of Shadwick as disgusting and horrific. So uh, David Sibley argues that this has got a long history stemming from uh, 19th century myths about working class uh, living conditions and behaviour. Uh, social reformists such as Edwin Chadwick and Charles Booth, they made moral judgments on the poor by associating proximity to dirt with moral degradation. Uh, and these ideas fit with the way class has been associated with areas marked by uh, dirt, disease and crime and uh, how these areas can become, then become signifiers of social class. Uh, there are other variations on this nickname as well, such as uh, Ship Brusky, which acknowledges the Eastern European migrant workers that live, in, that live there. So that kind of adds a new dimension to it. Um, so in addition to the already existing stigma associated with poverty and class, there's also uh, stigma associated with ethnic origin and migration status as well. So there's a, a racial element to the territorial <coughs> stigma there. Uh, in, in that article there, there's descriptions of abandoned build, buildings, um, and a pub that had been closed down and it's been boarded up, vandalised. And these sort of imageries of a decaying neighbourhood, uh, the further additions to the territorial stigma. So uh, there are ref references to criminality in the article, including gangs, violence, arson, vandalism, theft and drug taking. And there, there are examples of class-based disgust, which other the inhabitants of Shirebrook too, through a, like a perceived lack of taste. It quite often... Um, sort of uh, talks about the clothes that the residents are alleged to wear, which is kind of baseball caps and track suits, that sort of thing. Uh, the working class are often discussed in, uh, in terms of their appearance, and that often revolves around the track suit, which has kind of become uh, synonymous with you know, the working class folk devil figure, the chaff. So uh, as well as the references to drug taking and criminality, there's also references to drinking. Uh, to quote from the Isle of Air website in, in Shirebrook, the lads are pissed on cheap cider and the local Chavets on Lam Lambrini. Uh, these representations kind of fit with the way working class is stigmatised. Uh, around a Chav discourse um, and they're sort of characterised as being out of control and pathological. Uh, the reference to cheap cider and Lambrini sort of conform conforms to this idea that the working class lack taste and make bad and vulgar consumer choices. Uh, finally, it it's also says these uh, vulgar consumer choices, drug and drink habits are all paid for by benefits. So essentially these are class-based markers that have been used by, argued by several class theorists, such as Steph Lawler and Imogen Tyler, um, and other, other and stigmatise the working class. Um, to quote Steph Lawler, they do a great deal of work in, in coding a whole way of life that is deemed repellent. So um, what does it mean for... What does it mean for them? So Wacon claims that public and private resources often diminish in territorially stigmatised areas. Uh, he argues that they're less likely to receive investment, um, resources and services as well, uh, which can lead to further stigmatisation and spiralling decline. He also argues that residents are likely to disassociate uh, and demonise their neighbours, um, blame each other for the poor state in a neighbourhood for crime, antisocial behaviour. So this is argued to weaken already frail collectivities, uh, which further damages any potential for collective resistance. Um, Pierre Bourdieu, in distinction, argues that the devaluation of the working class, which can stem from stigma, uh, results in a lack of political authority. So because of the subordinate position, it's perceived that they don't have the same ability or right to make political claims that dominant groups do. So if the taste is not seen as legitimate, then why would political claims or anything else they say, happen, say be deemed as such? So similarly, Nancy Fraser uh, argues that subordinate working class are not recognised as having status equality with dominant groups, so lack of authority to ask political questions. So this, is, this has implications for the ability of dominant, dominant group, dominated groups to resist unfavourable conditions, but also re raises serious questions about democracy um, and the reproduction of an established order. So to what extent is this happening in Shirebrook? So I can't make any bold claims because I said at the beginning it's based on a small amount of data, mainly from pilot work. So, and the project's still ongoing, of course, as well. Um, but there is, there is some evidence to support these ideas. So in terms of this investment, uh, there's a large plot of land that previously housed the pub, uh, which you can see on the, on the slide. Also flats and, uh, and houses on, on the same, same plot. 
Uh, it was bought by Tesco's in 2009 to build a supermarket. But they essentially left it like that, um, empty and disused, and it sort of fell into disrepair, it was vandalised. Uh, this was over the next four years. Uh, eventually, in January 2013, they decided to demolish it. Um, <laughs> two years after that, 2015, uh, they decided they weren't going to build the store anymore. So um, this was because of financial difficulties, but they still own the land. Um, so the site's been left derelict. It's been enclosed with uh, seven-foot-high blue fencing, which you can see there. Um, and the locals call it the bomb site. Uh, it covers quite a large area, so the store was going to be 45,000 square feet. There was also another 30,000 square feet for other retail units uh, on the same site. It was part of the local council's master plan to bring more investment into the town, more visitors and uh, more vis visitors to the existing businesses. So Tesco's financial difficulties over recent years have been well documented. So, you know, it'd be difficult to blame the disinvestment solely on the territorial stigma of Shire Group, but they have uh, had the site long before they experienced any financial difficulty and, di and did nothing with it. Um, and I find it a little bit difficult to believe that it would have been left like that uh, and over such a long period of time in a more affluent, affluent area. Local residents are really angry about how the site's been left. Uh, it's been derelict for seven years now, so, um, and it's, it's going to uh, contribute to the uh, idea that the village is dilapidated and decaying and add further to the territorial stigma of Shirebrook. Uh, with regard to uh, the disassociation and demonization of neighbor, neighbors discussed by Wakam, there's not quite the picture of atomization that he describes happening there. So uh, at this stage of the research, it actually appears to be an element of the community who remain close-knit. Um, uh, with the participant observation in the community meeting, it was really well attended. There was about 300 people there. Um, and the meeting had been organized by a community group called Shirebrook Together who were established with the stated aims of tackling antisocial behaviour in the village and to challenge the local council, who they believe were not acting in their interests. Where disassociation and demonisation does occur, it's against the Eastern European migrant workers at Sports Direct. Uh, there are accusations of antisocial behaviour, including drinking and urinating in the street, um, and they, along with Sports Direct, who, who brought and frequently blame for the decline in the village. Uh, it appears from work so far that the established residents perceive the arrival of the Eastern European migrants is the biggest problem in the village. Um, there's, there's no real acknowledgement of deindustrialization, although the loss of the colliery is <coughs> lamented. Uh, there's no real acknowledgement of the deregulated economy and prolifer proliferation of poor quality work either, uh, which both groups endure. Um, so rather than a picture of complete atomization, it appears as a strong community of established residents who disassociate, disassociate and demonize and blame low, low status others in the shape of Eastern European workers. Um, perhaps the strong sense of community could be understood as a relic from the uh, coal mining history. The boundedness and collectivity of industrial communities, I think, were exaggerated, um, particularly in the community studies tradition. But I think there's something in this. Um, in their study of a deindustrialized town in Wales, uh, Walker, Dine and uh, Jimenez argue that the town's collective history of insecurity and struggle forged a strong community, but at the same time made them hostile and suspicious towards outsiders. So that's something I want to pursue uh, as the PhD goes on. Uh, finally, with regard to weak and political authority that Borgia and Fraser uh, talk about, uh, there is some evidence of this. So at the large meeting I attended, one of the issues to be raised was with the local council. So there was a petition uh, that attendees were asked to sign, which was avail available online on change.org, uh, that demanded the resignation of the representatives of Shirebrook. Uh, the online version cited the reason is the council had nothing to offer residents but smugness, arrogance, and utter contempt for the locals who have zero confidence in any of the councillors. So I, I was a bit sceptical about that, um, but once the meeting got underway, I kind of witnessed it first hand. Um, there was one in particular, one councillor, who was, uh, he, he kind of sneered at the residents all the way through, re it repeatedly dismissed the uh, residents and he kept calling them your lot all the time. Um, he went on to become more and more aggressive, re repeatedly dismiss dismissing concerns, uh, he claimed he'd answered questions, but your lot don't want to listen to the answers. So at this stage, I don't know if there's any uh, specific events uh, before, the, before the meeting that triggered it, but they do indicate another in of Shybrook residence by the councillor, uh, especially when they repeat it to his your lot. Um, 
rather than acting as a representative, a representative on for the community. The other who draws kind of a clear boundary between them and suggests that the political de demands of the residents are not seen to be legitimate by their elected representatives. The general feeling that the meeting was of contempt. So I, I wrote in my field notes that there seemed to be a feeling that the council, uh, that the community felt let down by the council, so that they weren't doing enough for them. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, I've illustrated some of the ways that Shirebrook and its residents are stigmatised, and I've argued that there is some evidence to suggest um, uh, to suggest that uh, to support these theories, but rather than resorting in the uh, atom atomization result uh, suggested by Wacon, it appears to have man manifested in disassociation, demonisation, and blame being aimed at Eastern European migrant workers. I'd argue that whilst the residents of Shirebrook focus on and lay blame at the door of low status others, um, probably the real causes of inequality, such as deindustrialisation and the wider political economy, remain unchallenged.